Governor Gary Herbert, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions today. Thanks for having me on. The Utah Restaurant Association, the American Beverage Institute, Ski Utah, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and many other organizations and groups have spoken out against the idea of lowering the blood alcohol limit for DUI qualification in Utah. What good comes from lowering the blood alcohol limit when the majority of the deaths come from those who have blood alcohol content of 0.15 and higher? Well, the intent of the legislation is, in fact, to make public safety at the forefront and to save lives. I guess the debate's going to be whether it does or does not. And frankly, I, I'm still analyzing the data myself. I'm going to be meeting with people and different stakeholders, and including those people involved in public safety, our Department of Transportation folks, our Highway Patrol, and analyze the data to see if, in fact, this does advance the cause of public safety. And after I do that, then I'll make a decision over whether I sign it into law or veto it. Are you leaning one way or the other at this point? I'm really not. I'm really open to the data. I'm trying not to be emotional about this thing. I want to make sure we have good policy. I do understand the arguments on both sides. And certainly there are many countries around the world that have not only have it at 0 .05 or lower, some have it at 0 .0. You don't drink and drive ever. Between Utah's liquor laws and the Bears Ears situation, should Utah lawmakers, including yourself, be more concerned about the public perception outside of Utah? Well, I think what we want to make sure is we have good policy. The people of Utah uh, elect people at the local level, at the state legislature, the governor, our congressional delegation, to develop policy that represents the views of the people of Utah. That's sometimes a tough thing to do, but that's where the policy should come from. That's where we should get our direction. And uh, what the public perception is outside of our borders is what the public perception is. That being said, uh, clearly, when we've uh, the fastest growing state in America, people want to come here. They like the quality of life. We have the best, most diverse economy in America today. People come here because they have job opportunities. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to do business. Our tourism and travel has been up double digits each of the last three years. Our problem right now is how do we accommodate growth and how do we accommodate all the people that want to come to Utah and it's a beautiful state, why would they not want to come here? Wonderful people, friendly, optimistic, hopeful. This is a great environment to be around. So I think the, per uh, the perception of Utah is actually very positive, by the way. Fodor Travel last year named the entire state of Utah the number one travel destination in the world. They didn't say just go to the ski resorts or Deer Valley or our parks, uh, state or national. They said the entire state of Utah, the number one travel mm -hmm. destination. So the perception of Utah around the world, certainly in America, is one that's very, very positive. Is outdoor retailer gone for good? Has there been any movement since that whole episode came about? There's been some shuttle diplomacy, some discussion. I think people are a little unsatisfied with how things ended. Uh, the hanging up on the governor of Utah was not probably a good thing to do. Uh, there's, uh, I think, an attempt to have better dialogue and better understanding of the issues. Uh, and so, as I said to them when we met, uh, I said, let's not find a lose-lose out of this thing. Let's see if we can find the proverbial win-win. And uh, I still think there's that opportunity. And we'll continue to have the door open and say, we'd like to keep the outdoor retailers here. And uh, we'll see what happens. Um, it's been disappointing to me uh, how uh, things have happened and how th the outcome. I think we need to have an all hands on deck, including the local communities in Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City need to engage more in this issue than they've done in the past. And I think there is still opportunity for us to retain the outdoor retailer show, but we'll have to see. It's gonna be a decision they need to make and I hope they make it based on the facts and the merits, not just on a, some kind of political statement they wanna make. And uh, likewise, uh, we, our actions, you know, we need to make sure our actions uh, are speaking louder than some of the rhetoric that we have out there. So the messaging really is important. And, but we're doing a lot of good things for the public lands. Uh, we value the public lands in, in the state of Utah. We have a lot more public lands than any other state other than Nevada. We have 15 million more uh, public acres than we have in 
Colorado, for example, we're a lot more convenient, more accessible. We spend more money on conservation here in the Intermountain West than the next two or three states combined. And the results of that is that our, our uh, deer herds are up, our bighorn sheep, our elk, our fisheries, our water reclamation, and all those things that people want to see uh, in protection and, uh, of our public lands are happening. We've not, by the way, reduced one acre of public land over the last generation or more that I know of. There may be some trades made as things happen occasionally with our school trust lands, but not only have we not lost any public acres, we've added by uh, opening up private land uh, and protecting Indian artifacts, for example. The Wilcox Ranch comes to mind and others out there. So we've opened up a lot of private land for the public to have access to along with the public lands we have of over 35 million acres of public land. So. Uh, I think there's a, a good argument why the outdoor retailer show should stay in Utah, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Now, both the legislature and you have asked the White House, President Trump, to rescind the Bears Ears National Monument. What do you hear that for? Where is that whole thing? Well, it's unclear. Uh, you know, uh, I think the concern that we had in Utah, one, we had the Grand Staircase Escalante, which was kind of foisted upon us uh, really in a very clandestine way. The governor found out about it by reading about it in the paper. The president had lied to our congressional delega delegation, including the Democrat at the time. So that was really a little bit off-putting. Um, so part of that's why there's a little bit of concern about all of a sudden we have the, the bear's ears. And um, I think the biggest concern is really seemingly a lack of uh, response in, in by the Obama administration to the desires of the people of Utah. Again, at best, we're divided on it. Mm. And so I think the intent would be to find the best optimal place to be. Everybody seemed to agree that would be done legislatively if we really want to protect and enhance protections in that area. Legislatively is the best way to do it. And it gives the Native Americans a co-management capability where they have more to say about what they call their sacred lands. So I think that's still a, the, the best approach to take. We'll have to wait and see. I've talked to Secretary Zinke, and he's going to come and view what's taking place in Utah and have a little better view up close and personal with our public land situation here in Utah. And we'll see what happens going forward. If the Bears Ears National Monument is rescinded, is that goodbye to outdoor retailer? I mean, is that a, a non-starter for them? Well, that's up to them to say. That's kind of how they've couched it. You know, it doesn't matter all the other 99 good things you've done, this this one thing that really is causing them problems. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, then, uh, you know, that's a little short-sighted, I think, on their part. Uh, that being said, uh, it, it's, it's a repeal and replace situation. We've never said rescind it and just let it go back the way it was. Although, by the way, this is all public land. It will always be public land. It will be managed and controlled by the BLM. They've already put enhanced protections on the land without the monument. And the accessibility that we have to that land will continue. The monument actually kind of restricts some accessibility and things to be done there. There is no oil and gas. I mean, people say, oh, you're doing this for the oil and gas industry. That's just poppycock. There is no oil and gas in the area. And everybody seems to agree that there needs to be some protection. So I think we're a little short-sighted if we concentrate only on the monument aspects of it when we're talking about uh, enhanced protection everybody agrees to, better to be done legislatively. And let's give the Native Americans more to say about the management of lands they consider sacred. Let's go back to liquor, land, uh, liquor laws for just a second. The Zion Curtains are going to be coming down in some restaurants in exchange for a buffer zone. Are you satisfied with that? Well, I introduced the idea in my State of the State address, and I talked about a need to revisit our alcohol laws, but I said the focus has got to be on uh, health and public safety. And that, whatever we do with our alcohol laws, that should be the focus. Public health, public safety. Now the media, uh, you know, seems to focus on the preparation wall, so-called Zion Curtain. And that's certainly part of the mix out there as far as the discussion that's occurred and the resulting le legislation that's come out of that. Uh, but I think we are in fact enhancing public safety and we're enhancing, you know, uh, public health. Uh, we've done a, a pretty good job of that in the past. I think we'll do even a better job of that going forward into the future, preventing underage drinking, binge drinking, uh, getting the impaired drivers off the road, and protecting public safety. So I think this has been a positive step forward. 
And the good news for the private sector out there is that they have choice and options. It's not been fair, it's not been equitable. The grandfathering, uh, really, of the Zion uh, preparation wall curtain has is, is been not fair for everybody. It's uh, been an exception. So this eliminates that um, grandfathering clause, and I think it makes it more equitable for everybody and a better alcohol policy for Utahns. Between the automatic gas tax increase bill, talk of hiking the food tax, the increase in the tax on alcohol, and efforts to tax internet sales. Are Utah Republicans becoming the party of tax and spend? <laughs> well, I expect those who are not Republican and, and want to find a way to criticize, uh, you know, would say that, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, tax policy has to be reviewed periodically. Why? Because the marketplace is dynamic. It changes. And what was right and plausible yesterday may be questionable today and wrong tomorrow. Uh, you know, you talk about the uh, remote sales tax on purchases m made online. That's been a law that's been on the books since the Great Depression back in the 1936-37. And it wasn't a big deal then because not many purchases were being made remotely. Some catalog sales maybe. But now, the last decade, we've seen a proliferation of online purchases. The taxes are owed, but not collected. That reflects a change of the marketplace that ought to be reflected in tax policy. That's a good example of, of why we need to change that. It might be of interest to you to note that here, uh, about a decade ago, 72% of all goods being produced, you know, our GDP, rather, was taxed. 72% of the GDP would be taxed. Today it's only 40%. That means we've narrowed the base, which is why we have pressure to raise the rates. That's not good tax policy. It's time for us to revisit the marketplace and say what is the best tax policy for today? Where we broaden the base, have the ability to lower the rates, everybody kind of pay their what we say their fair share, which does not have a dampening effect on economic growth and expansion. Best thing we can do for anybody, including poor people, is give them a job and not give them government subsidy, give them an opportunity to be self-sufficient, have the pride of work, and get them uh, paid enough money to support themselves and their family. So our focus ought to be for, for, foremost on how do we grow the economy, and what is the tax policy will allow us to do that, and still extract out of the economy enough revenue to pay for the government needs that we the people think are important. Why no overall tax reform legislation this session? It's not easy. It's a heavy lift. I mean, every entity out there says, well, tax them, but don't tax me. And uh, so uh, to find that optimal point is something that takes some time. We did tax reform when I was lieutenant governor back in 2005 and 2006. It took us a couple of years to go through this and come up with a good program, which helped us, by the way, get through the Great Recession better than any state in America and has helped lead us to become the best performing economy in America today. It's just time to revisit that same thing. And I never expected, even when I introduced it again at my state of the state, that we could do this in one session. It's too complex, it's too hard. Uh, but I do expect us to get it through, and, and we've started it, we've made a very aggressive approach this session. I do expect us to complete some tax reform by the end of the 2018 session. There are those who are in excruciating pain right now because opioids can't help them. They are hoping for the day that Utah will have m legal medical marijuana. Based on what the legislature did this session, should they be satisfied with where that issue stands now or should they put even more support behind the ballot initiative? Well, I think they can do what they think is appropriate from their own perspective, but from a pr perspective of developing policy, we've got to have the right laws in place we can't just turn a blind eye like the federal government's done or this past administration and say, yes, it's a violation of federal law. We'll just ignore that. That's not good policy. And clearly there's certainly anecdotal evidence and a lot of stuff, uh, uh, science out there that kind of leads us to believe that appropriate use uh, for medicinal marijuana would be something that ought to be encouraged. But we ought to have the science to back it up. And so the need to have research and have an understanding of what the science does say. So maybe your physiology would be have a one kind of dosage and mine would be different. We have to understand that. So it's prescribed by a doctor, distributed through by, by prescription as a, a controlled substance. Then we can get the results that we can anticipate from science. 
But uh, I can tell you that the jury's still out on this. I've talked with Governor Hickenlooper over in Colorado. He was against recreational use of marijuana. He knows that many states have used the medicinal aspect of marijuana to lead to recreational use. And he's told me, and as he told other governors, be very careful. We're having it in Colorado. Watch, it's not all turning out to be the, the plus that we thought it was going to be, and we ought to be careful. And that really means let's take it step by step by step by step and get to the right place. Uh, we're not there now, but I think we're on the right road going the right direction. If we had a cooperative federal government, uh, so we can get the research done. I think that would just enhance our opportunity to get there quicker. Could Utah lawmakers go even faster, though, on the medical marijuana issue? Is it possible for them to move more quickly than they are? I don't think we want to drag our feet. Let's move as quickly as we can, but we've got to have our partners in, in Washington, D.C. to help us take it off the Schedule Three list of uh, preventative drugs. I mean, we've got to have cooperation there on the federal laws. But let's do the research, let's be ready. It takes time. I mean, FDA approval, you know, can take uh, way much more time than it should. And hopefully this new administration has promised to streamline uh, processes and regulations to get things done quicker. This is an example of where we can do some better things and do them quicker. So we need to have partnership with the federal government to get to where we want to be if, in fact, we agree that we should have medicinal use of marijuana. This past legislative session, uh, lawmakers passed a record 535 bills and sent, are supposed to be sending them to you. Um, have you seen all of them yet, number one, and are you thinking of vetoing any of them? Well, I haven't seen them all. There's a process that takes them when we adjourn, sign a die on Thursday night at midnight. Our work just continues for in the next 20 days where we have the signing and or veto period to review. But there's a little lag, uh, lag time there between the time that they finish passing them and their delivery to us to review them. And we're in that lag time right now. We've only had, you know, a handful of bills that have come of the 535. That will start to accelerate the volume that will come to our office. We'll uh, starting to increase 50, 100 a day. So we'll finally get them all. And then we have to review them. <laughs> That's not an e easy task. We have to read them all again, understand what they mean, what their intent is uh, to accomplish with policy, decide whether that's good policy or not. But more importantly, look and see the uh, unintended consequence if there's something there that we haven't seen. And of course, on some of the bills, we're going to be lobbied heavy to sign or to veto, and that's just a typical thing that comes after every session. We listen to those comments. We try to analyze what they're saying and see if it makes sense to us. And frankly, I have not made any decision on any bills as far as vetoing. I know some bills that raise to a level of at least concern, but we'll go through the process and I'll make a decision over the next, what, about 15 days left. Which bills concern you the most? When you talk about a veto, which bills concern you the most at this point? All of them. <laughs> we have 535 of them, which is a record number. And uh, we find things that we thought were innocuous. Uh, it become maybe a problem. Maybe it's a violation of Constitution or existing separation of powers between the executive and legislative branch, uh, appointment to committees and things that didn't seem like it was such a big problem when we were going through the process with the legislature. Now we see it in the light of day and say that's a, that's a big issue. We've been very good as an administration to work with the legislature in saying let us help you shape these bills so we don't have to veto them. So a lot of bad bills we get uh, sidetracked and, and, and aren't, don't get passed. We kill them during the session. Uh, that's a, a major step in the right direction. Other bills that are questionable, we help them uh, shape them so that they get to a point where we feel like they're going to be okay or not worthy of a veto. And so consequently, we don't have as many vetoes in our state because of the proactive and good positive relationship we have as an executive branch working with the legislative branch. You mentioned that. This last legislative session, there didn't seem to be any acrimony, didn't seem to be any tussling or wrestling. I mean, how much of what got done up there happened behind closed doors so that the public infighting didn't appear? Well, I think even behind closed doors in some of the caucus meetings, and I was not there, but there is a lot of good work and uh, I think uh, respect for difference of opinion and uh, congeniality. Uh, and that includes the Democrats. I meet with the Democrat leadership uh, every week, as well as I meet with the Republican leadership, so we can stay in communication and understand the pros and cons of their points of view on different pieces of legislation. Communication really is a key, and I think that's uh, something we do very well in Utah. We communicate well with respect and civility. 
and that allows us to get more things done and it's not it doesn't become as petty well you didn't vote for my bill so I'm not gonna vote for your bill we see that in many parts of the country we see it in spades in Washington DC and they don't uh, accomplish much of anything and that's part of the reason I mean they're good at doing two things one is nothing and two is kicking the can down the road but in Utah we collaborate and you'll find that the majority of our bills probably 80 percent plus are passed unanimously people come together with some common sense and say yeah this makes uh, good sense to pass and we do it and uh, so it's only a very few bills that are really very divisive President Trump has been in office now a couple of months how would you say he's doing well he's certainly unique in how he goes about things his messaging and how he his rhetoric sometimes is a little bit off-putting to many people and puzzling to many others uh, but when I look at the substance of what he's doing, his appointments, who he's putting around him, I start with uh, my good friend Mike Pence, the vice president, uh, I think is a very good man of substance and experience. And as I told Mike when I saw him here a couple of weeks ago, you know, you give me a lot of hope because you're there helping steer the ship of state. Uh, I look at the appointments with governors, I'm partial to governors, and Rick Perry over energy will be coming to Utah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Secretary Zinke uh, is doing good. The new Secretary of Health, uh, I think, has got some really, he's a medical doctor, Tom Price, and he's got really good experience and understands how it fits together. Uh, we've got Sonny Perdue, who's going to be the Secretary of Agriculture, former governor of Georgia, uh, and he's actually a farmer and agriculture, uh, you know, kind of in his bailiwick. So we don't have just a political appointment. We have actually tried to appoint people that have got background and experience in the roles that they're going to uh, play and, and who they're going to supervise and oversee. So I like the appointments. Uh, Gorsuch for the Supreme Court, I, it shouldn't matter whether anybody's a Republican, Democrat, liberal, or, or conservative. It should be that they're going to interpret the law and apply the facts of the law and make a decision, no matter whether it's popular or unpopular. No activism from the bench. And I feel that Gorsuch will do that. That's the way all judges should be. And uh, so I feel good about the appointment process. And what I really feel good about is there's been a clear uh, signal that we're going to uh, devolve power out of Washington, D.C. and back to the states. The laboratories of democracy, where successes really are taking place, where innovation and creativity, where the taxpayers' dollars are being uh, spent wisely and effectively. And Utah is certainly a perfect example of that. So the devolution of power back to the states on all the issues out there, I think, are significantly important, particularly uh, the uh, topic of, at hand is health care. But more state involvement uh, and more uh, ability for them to have flexibility to make their own decisions is going to be a godsend to the country. You did not support Donald Trump in the presidential election, but from the sounds of things, you might become a supporter at some point. <laughs> Do you see yourself ever doing that? Well, I supported President Obama when he was the president, too. I didn't agree with some of his policies and many of the things he did and, and uh, uh, tried to, to accomplish. But that doesn't mean that he was not my president. I worked with him, met with him over 16 times, probably more than anybody in our delegation combined. And trying to say, you know what, I'm a Republican from a very red state, but we want to work with the, with the administration and accomplish good things, which we were able to do. Uh, when they had the closing down of the of our national parks, for example, I worked with the Secretary Sally Jewell and the Obama administration to open them back up. So we saved the economy of rural Utah. So you can work with people, and I expect I'm going to work with President Trump and, and my good friend, the Vice President, Mike Pence, and he's making some good uh, decisions. I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. And where he's right, we're going to support him. Where if he's wrong on areas, we'll disagree. That's the way the politics should be played. In regard to the outdoor burning, wood burning bill, HB 65, which would allow the burning of wood to prepare food even on red days, are you going to sign that bill? I don't know. You're asking me about signing these bills that I haven't had a chance to really weigh and consider the data and the uh, arguments for and the arguments against. So I will do that over these next, uh, you know, 10 days. Uh, and so that remains to be seen. What I do know is we have to meet criteria to clean up the air. We've been doing a significant heavy lift when it comes to cleaning up the air, our inversions, our topography, the uniqueness of what we have on the Wasatch Front and other parts of the state, by the way. 
And we understand the importance of having clean air for health ne needs and health issues, for economic opportunity, and we need to do what we need to do to clean up that air. So, um, again, I don't like anything that's going to hold us back from that. I understand the arguments both for and against this on the wood burn. I'm going to speak to the private sector about those that are f uh, for veto and those that are against uh, this piece of legislation, those that say, hey, it's, it's wise because we don't want to take power away from the Air Quality Board to make those kinds of tough decisions. By the way, the good news is we are very much uh, uh, doing good things to clean up the air. Again, we see those gunky days out there, and people wonder, and, and it's on their mind, certainly during the legislative session. But the good news is, on average, in Utah, we have 18 bad days. 18. L.A., San Bernardino, in the hundred, 125 bad days. So when they talk about the worst air in America, we have a spike here and there, which makes us the worst. But we only have the spike once or twice a year, whereas they have it in California multiple times. So keep it in perspective. We also have the cleanest air some days in the, in the nation, too. But on average, during the inversion time, we have 18 bad days where we exceed the federal standards. This year, nine. This year, wow. nine. Wow. So over the last decade, we've reduced the pollution along the Wasatch Front by 35 percent. That's a significant reduction. And at the same time, we've had about 300,000 more people that have moved on the Wasatch Front to call it home. So in spite of increased population, which makes it more difficult, we've reduced pollution by a significant number. Uh, industries spending hundreds of millions of dollars in trying to clean up and use best available technology. So it's all hands on deck, everybody involved. We passed out some uh, new incentives here with our refineries to help them incent them to bring in tier three fuels, uh, which is uh, gonna be the best thing we can do to help uh, uh, reduce air pollution along the Wasatch Front. And it's the tailpipes is the biggest problem right now. It's not industry, it's not the refineries, certainly not Kennecott, it's, it's really the tailpipe issue out there, which we've got to get a handle on. So everybody has a role to play. If we're going to really address this issue, everybody needs to be cognizant of their own uh, pollution footprint and do what they can to reduce it. What do you think of the Congressional Republicans' replacement of Obamacare? Well, I think it's a step in the right direction. What we do know this, under the Affordable Care Act, it's not sustainable on two fronts. One, the providers are bailing. They're leaving in Utah which has the lowest cost health care in America today and about the fifth rate is best quality. We're, we live in a really great state when it comes to health care. But in Utah, out of our 29 counties, there's only 13 of them, or there's only 13 now that have just one provider. So it limits our choice of where you can go to get your insurance coverage and, and, and uh, have your insurance paid for through an insurance program. So those providers have been losing so much money that they're abandoning the system. Uh, and that we see that reflected this year, particularly with the increasing insurance premium costs. In Utah, it's about 24%. Uh, it's averaging more than that nationwide. In Arizona, it's a 100% increase in the premiums. That's not sustainable when it comes to those who provide the insurance coverage. Secondly, it's costing a grundle of money. And where's the money going to come from? We have a federal government that's deficit spending now to the tune of $20 trillion. We've got to bend that cost curve for health care, which is nobody's talking about other than Republican governors saying, somebody's got to step up and say, let's address the rising cost of health care, not just how we pay for it. And so I think this is a step in the right direction. It's not perfect. Uh, it will reduce the deficit, which, you know, we need to start thinking about seriously and, uh, and provide more flexibility back to the states. If Utah could take the money and develop our own program with it, we'd come up with a better program than we have on the books now, which would provide more health care for more people at lower cost than what we have coming out of the Affordable Care Act. So let the states innovate, let them create ways, uh, give them maximum flexibility, block grant the money back. I think that's the major principles we need to go forward on. And at the same time, let's make sure what we come up with is sustainable, that in fact stakeholders and, and providers are willing to per participate and be a, a part of it, and that we can fund it. The, the, we have a bill to pay. Let's make sure that the federal government can pay their bills and the state can pay their bills. It's a partnership that we need to work on. As we wrap up, what is the biggest issue facing Utahns right now? Well, there's a number of issues out there, some bigger than others. Uh, the biggest issue for me, frankly, is one that's reflective of our success. 
we are doing so well in virtually every category that you can measure. I have governors call me every week and say, how did you do this? And how are you having success here? Can you share with us? Which is the beauty of the 50 laboratories of democracy in our five territories, by the way. We share ideas and we learn from each other, learn from our successes, and learn from our failures. That's a beautiful part of our constitutional system. And uh, we need to remember that. Uh, the biggest challenge I face right now and that keeps me awake at night is really growth. We have unprecedented growth taking place here. Uh, and people are moving to Utah. They love the quality of life. Many of our companies now we find that are international and worldwide. Uh, the most requested transfer location in their worldwide system is Utah. People want to come here. They like being around you, Bob. They like the people here. They like the friendly personalities. They like the volunteerism. They like the charitable giving. They, it's just a great place to, to kind of hang out and live. There is no better place to live and raise a family. And they come here for economic opportunity because there's no better place for business. The American dream is alive and well in Utah. Upward mobility, the best place in America today is Utah. And so what happens now, I've got this influx of people that impacts our, our education system, our, our classrooms, which we're trying to uh, manage, you know, and increase teachers' salary and pay and get better outcomes for student achievement. That growth pressure infrastructure needs, our roads, the, the congestion on our roads. Again, we've built significant amounts of roads and widened them for capacity, and they're already obsolete. What are we going to do in the next phase? Mass transit, we're spending hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on mass transit. So the growth pressures impact everything. Infrastructure, water consumption, education, higher education, our college universities, health and human services. So the impact of growth is the biggest challenge we face and it's one of the results of the great successes we're having as a state. People want to come here and be a part of our success. Utah Governor Gary Herbert, thank you so much for being part of three questions today. My pleasure. Thank you very much.